Praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday evening Bible study with Gospel Lighthouse. So glad that you could uh, be in service tonight. Join with us as we uh, explore the Word of God. Uh, but as we begin tonight, I want to just uh, address the fact that uh, we should all be very grateful to God for another day of life and health and strength. Uh, the Lord has been favorable to our church assembly and to so many of us uh, keeping us from sickness at the same time uh, sustaining others around us but we do want to remember our private times of prayer or in corporate prayer to pray for all of those who have been afflicted by this uh, cursed disease or virus we pray that god would heal them hold them raise them up and uh, once again restore their life to uh, normalcy uh, for God and God alone can help us in this time. As we open service tonight, I'd like for us just to pray together. Uh, you pray there in your home or wherever you're at uh, viewing and pray that God would open your heart tonight and that his word would speak to you. It's going to be a night. There's going to be a little bit of uh, humor and uh, lightness uh, in some of what we say, but then there's going to be some very serious things that I'm going to share. And so I'm, I'm asking you to sincerely pray that God would let your heart be receptive to his word tonight. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we praise you. Lord, we are grateful again tonight just to be a part of your family, to have privilege and opportunity to look at your word, to hear your word, God, to grow from your word. I pray tonight that you would anoint every heart, every mind, God, but most of all, stir our souls tonight through the speaking of your word. Let your spirit work among us, God. Let it work now, but let it work miracles in the days to come. I pray speak to every heart. God, I pray encourage and bless your people tonight in the name of Jesus and everybody say amen. 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 Um, just before I get into the word of the Lord tonight, I want to make a couple of uh, brief announcements about the upcoming days ahead of us for church. Of course, uh, Friday night, uh, there will be a 7 p.m. Uh, Zoom group meeting for our young people. Again, if you happen to be uh, listening tonight and are not part of our local assembly, uh, invitations to that will be sent uh, in a particular manner. So I would just uh, tell you that to reach out to us uh, through our website, uh, there is a uh, prayer request line there or prayer request email uh, directed there. Go there, send a request through, send us your contact information. And as we are able to establish your identity, then uh, we will uh, connect you to that particular group. Uh, we want to reach everyone, but again, because of some things that have been happening with Zoom meetings online, we also want to be very protective and careful uh, for the sake of our young people and those involved in that. I pray that you will understand that. Uh, then this coming Sunday, it's Easter Sunday, great day of celebration in the Christian community as we celebrate the fact that our God is not dead, but that he is a risen Savior. And uh, at 10 a.m., as has been the last few weeks, there will be uh, online service for our Spanish-speaking community, and we encourage you to join that, be a part of that. You can find uh, our YouTube channel through our church website, which is gospellighthouse497.com. Again, that's G-O-S-P-E-L-L-I-G-H-T. H-O-U-S-E dot 497.com. I'll get it all rattled out for you here in a minute. Uh, but go there. You can find the YouTube channel. And if you are Spanish speaking or have family members that are and want them to enjoy great ministry of the word, uh, then go there. One of our uh, assistant pastors here from the church, uh, Reverend Fernando Gonzalez, uh, will be ministering. Just be a great, great time for you and your family. But then in the 11 o'clock hour, uh, it's going to be a little different in that we want to invite all of you to uh, see a little bit of the outdoors. Uh, get up, get dressed in your Sunday best, get in your car, and before you leave home, take care of any uh, personal necessities, uh, bathroom visits, any of that. But come to 
uh, 497 Fair Oaks uh, here in Aurora Grande uh, to Gospel Lighthouse. We are going to have Easter celebration by way of drive-in church. Uh, our parking lot's going to be set up. Nobody out milling around except for the few leaders that are involved in the service administration. But we want you to come. You'll be directed in to park. You will remain in your vehicle at all times. Uh, again, we are uh, doing our best and intend to uh, carry that out to uh, honor the shelter, not only shelter in place, but more so the social distancing respect of six feet distance between everybody. Uh, but you will come, you will park, you'll be able to roll down your window, and uh, from there, we're going to have live music, we're going to have worship, we're going to have praise, and then I, Pastor Stephen Hill, am going to be absolutely crazy. Uh, I'm going up to the second level of our lighthouse that we have here on site, part of our church facility, and I'm going to preach from that second level. So it's going to be an exciting day, a fun day, and I encourage you. Come be a part, but if you're listening tonight, don't just come be a part, but invite somebody to meet you here. Don't mix your families together. Stay with your single households, but invite others to come and be a part. Everybody needs to get out and see the sunshine, and this is a great chance to do that. So, again, I encourage you. That's 11 o'clock this Sunday. I hope to see you there. All right, let's, let's get to the Word of God tonight. And uh, as I start into the Word of God tonight, I'm just going to kind of launch into this. Uh, I'll read some scripture in a minute. This is not always my style, but for the case of tonight, uh, I think that it's what's right and appropriate. I, I want to speak tonight on this subject, the hope of a haircut. You heard me right. The hope of a haircut. Now, I know you're already saying that's got to be the most insane sermon title I've ever heard in my life. That's okay. You're probably looking at the most insane preacher you've ever heard in your life if you haven't already heard me. I'm unorthodox. I'm kind of off the chart. But I want to speak to your heart tonight. Let me, let me tell you how uh, this particular Bible lesson came, came into works. Uh, this present situation called shelter in place, uh, which was instituted by government state officials and by health officials, uh, with the attempt to flatten the curve, as they call it, for COVID-19, uh, I feel like has thrown all of us into adjustments of daily life, uh, both great and small. We're finding that life is lived much differently today than it was just a few weeks ago. And for me, um, outside of being in what I call lockdown, was the fact that I was going to have to get a haircut at some point. But the bigger question was not just, when am I going to get a haircut, but who is going to cut my hair? You say, well, big deal. Go get a haircut. Well, I am very, very, very particular and picky about my hair. Whether you think so or not. You may not think it is, but nonetheless, I am. And so it is and has been my habit through the years. I... I choose to find a barber or a stylist who does a great job, and then I don't change that. They have my business. As long as they do a great job, they have my business. Uh, I'm very loyal. I've had very few uh, barbers or stylists in my lifetime, going all the way back to my years in high school. I just, I mean, it's like, if you're still there, I'm still here. This works. Let's do it. I become very comfortable and I'm able to go in and sit down in the chair and just relax and talk and I, I like to talk and let them cut away because why? I develop a relationship of trust with them. Well, all of a sudden with shelter in place and all the businesses being closed and the fact that I just moved over here a few months ago, 
not only had I not yet found a stylist that I was comfortable with, but now all of a sudden I had no one. And discussion started in my home, and I began to realize very quickly that there was one person that was going to be able to cut my hair. And to all you gentlemen out there, you already know the answer. It's my wife. It's my wife. You have to understand, I traveled in itinerant ministry, what we call, again, and most of you know I traveled as an evangelist for a number of years all over the country. And I uh, have to tell you, I have had some really, really, really bad haircuts. Bad doesn't, isn't even an acceptable word. Terrible haircuts. Um, even just a couple of years ago when my grandmother passed away, I had to get a haircut because um, I'd flown from out of state and uh, I won't say who, uh, well, but my sister referred me to someone and uh, I have to tell you, it was by far the worst I've ever had in my life. I, I thought the woman had scalped me. It was terrible. So I, I have this uh, severe fear of getting a haircut from somebody I don't know. You say, where's the scripture? Stay with me for a minute. So it is, I finally decided, you know what? My wife's going to have to cut my hair. And so I bought the trimmers, clippers. And this past Monday night, I sat down in the chair draped me with a sheet and covered the floor with a sheet. And she went to work. And I have to tell you, when she was through, I was absolutely amazed. And I told her, I said, I think you just gave me the best haircut I've had in the last 10 years, maybe ever. And she looked at me in her nice, sweet way, as she always does. She said, I've been telling you for years I could do it. I just don't know why you haven't let me before now. And the wheels of a preacher's mind begin to run. Because again, for years she was right. She had told me she could do it. She had seen what others had done. She knew what needed to be done. And she told me I can do it. I, I can do what they can do and probably do it better. Now, why I never let her do it before, let her cut my hair before, was simply because I was stuck in my own rut and my own way of doing things. And while I, I knew that she could, I wasn't willing to let her because I didn't want to lose control. You know, because every once in a while, my wife and I might have a slight disagreement. It would be her chance to take revenge. It would be her chance to set the score straight. But all of that said, why did I let her now? One reason. Because a crisis had arisen in my life that left me with no one else to go to. Nobody else to trust. Nobody else to turn to. You say, well, do you have a trust issue with your wife? No, not really. We've been married 35 years. I'm going to tell you, I'm a man. I have made some really, really bad decisions in 35 years of marriage, 35 years in August. And she has stayed with me. She has stood beside me. She has picked me up when I'm down. She has defended me. My wife loves me. I have no question. So I recognize that I can trust her. She has a vested interest. She doesn't want to walk around with a guy who looks like he's been scalped. She wants me to be at my best. And yet, for whatever reason, because I had a way I had been doing things for years, no matter how much I knew she loved me, no matter how much I knew that I could trust her, no matter how much I knew that she cared about me being at my best, and regardless of how many times she told me, you, you, you just let me try. I said, no, I'm going to do it my way. 
only to come back later and say it didn't work out again. I got to find another somebody. But when this crisis came, I had to reach to the one that had patiently for years been telling me, I can help you. I can do this. I can make it work. And from there, I began to realize, you know what, this is a lot like what's going on in our world today. It's really like what goes on in our world all the time. We've got a God that loves us. We've got a God that has a vested interest in our lives. A God that is continually telling us, I can help you with that. Your life can be better than that. Whatever you think life can give you, I, 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 can, I can do that and better and more. And he's stayed with us. He's loved us. He's been patient with us. He's proven himself. And yet how many times do we hear God's word and when God speaks and gives us direction and says, this will fix what's wrong, we choose to just say, no, God, I got this. I've been doing it this way forever. I don't need you to help me right now. But we are living in a different season and time of life. We are living with a world crisis. We're living with a health crisis. We're living with an economic crisis. And all of the people that we normally go to, they're just trying to survive on their own. And so the challenge tonight and what I'm, I'm driving at is the, the hope of a haircut for me was the fact that I knew when I sat down in the chair that I could trust the hands of the one who was going to do the work. I want you to understand tonight, I want us as believers, I want us as church members, I want anyone listening tonight to understand that you can trust the hands of God because God knew this day was coming long before you and I arrived here. The hope of that haircut was the revelation that sometimes it takes the adversity to get us slumped down long enough to get us seated in a position where God can work in our lives like he's always wanted to. See, my wife's always known that she can fix my problem. I just wasn't ready to let her do it. But here we are. And quite honestly, I think it turned out pretty nice. I don't know what you think, but I think it turned out pretty well. But just a few weeks ago, we had our jobs, we had our freedom, we had fun, we had entertainment, we had pleasures, planned futures, all the while knowing that our lives were not truly God-centered, nor our focus on eternity and the life which is to come. But now with COVID-19, can't go to work, the economy is faltering, loved ones and friends are sick and dying. Fear is forming a foundation in our lives and all the stuff that we, that we value seems so useless. We as people were fretting, thinking, what am I going to do about this or about that? I want to challenge you tonight to get all by yourself and in a quiet place and listen because you're going to hear God say, I can help you with that. I'm still here. Are you willing to listen now? Are you willing to to let my hands work in your life? Can I tell you it's time to sit down at the feet of Jesus and open the Bible and read and say and tell me one more time what is it you said you can do for me? I'm challenging somebody tonight to either listen to God again or maybe listen to God for the first time, hear his spirit speak and as his spirit speaks even through this Bible lesson or sharing in my heart tonight. Say, God, could you not only tell me again what you can do, but now, God, I'm asking you to do what you said you can do because I want you to know Jesus loves you. He cares. He will wash. He will cleanse. He will heal. He will restore. He will give you hope because this is what he has promised to do. He said he would give life and that more abundantly. But as we've moved into this season, I've realized that the reason God has stood so close to us so many years is because he knew this day would come. 
The reason that he's been so merciful in our life and our world is because he wanted to stay close enough for us to know that when life falls apart, God still yet remains. He saw this hour in time and he tried to prepare us. One of the big things that I'm, I'm hearing as I'm listening to all the news media is the big complaint country by country by country is, well, you know what, we weren't prepared for this. Well, it's hard to be prepared for what you don't know is coming. I don't know if, I'm, if that makes sense. It seems too simple to say that, but how can we be angry at government or anybody and say, you know, you should have had us prepared when none of us knew it was coming. But see, God loves us so much that God said there's some things that are coming in the workings of time and towards eternity. And he said, I'm, I'm going to tell you about those things before they come. Why would God tell us before they come? Because he said, I want to give you the opportunity to be prepared. See, that's real love is when you know something's going to happen. You share with those you love so that they can be prepared to offset whatever's coming. I've had some people ask and been much conversation. Well, do you think COVID-19 is the judgment of God? Let me, just, let me just say it this way. Judgment is a real word from the word of God. Judgment is an absolute fact. You have grace and you have judgment. You have mercy and you have judgment. But I want you to understand that people say, well, so God's judging. No, God has put before us, his word says, both life and death. He's given us a choice to obey or to disobey. Whatever negative or whatever what we call judgment is coming, we bring unto ourselves by our refusal to follow and listen and hear God. Let me give you the relation. A hope of a haircut. I got 35 years of bad haircuts because I refused to listen to the voice that said I know how to do it and now has proven 35 years later that their word was good as their hands. So many people choose to not trust God because they say, well, I don't know if I can trust Him. You will never know if you can trust Him until you try Him. Try the Lord and see if He is good. But God gave us some scriptures I want to read. I'm, I'm going to move pretty quickly here tonight. But Matthew 24, 3 through 8, related to times like the present, says that as He set up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto Him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? He had just told them that the temple was going to be destroyed. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? We know you're going to be taken away, Jesus, but we want to know when you're coming back. We know you're coming back, but we want to know what to be looking for. What should our focus be on? And when we see certain things, it will help us to know that you're soon to come. They went on to say, and of the end of the world. They understood the second coming of the Lord related to the end of the world as we know it. You say, oh, wait a minute now, preacher. I, I hear it now. You're going to tell us this is the end of the world. No, that's not what I'm telling you. But what I am going to tell you and you're going to see is that there are some signs that we are to be looking for. And there are some things that are clearly identifiable that make us in this time want to sit down, let me just say it in my simple, light, humorous way, makes me want to sit down in God's barber chair and say, okay, God, you take the clippers and you clean me up real good. You do whatever you need to do because I'm going to trust your hands now because everybody else I've been trusting all these years, they haven't done a good job. And as I'm reading this, I'm getting down to a time when my life needs to be ready to be presented for a great day of judgment in God. I want to hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye herein into my rest. I don't want to hear you say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You say, hey, that's old-fashioned. That's old-fashioned Pentecostal hellfire and brimstone. I'm going to tell you, I can preach hellfire and brimstone, but I'm also going to tell you there's streets of gold and gates of pearl and walls of jasper, and there's dancing 
and shouting and rejoicing for eternity. The choice becomes ours. It's whose chair are we going to sit in? Who are we going to lean to? And the things that are happening in the world at present have caused all of us to take a fresh, eternal reflection, perspective, and thought. Jesus answered their question. He said, don't let anybody deceive you. He said, many people are going to come. This is some of the signs of the time he's going to return. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and they shall deceive many. He said, you can't believe everybody that says, hey, I'm God, or I'm coming from God. He said, you're going to hear, listen to this. He said, you're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars. He said, but see that you not be troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. This is God who loves us, who died for us, telling us if you want to know when I'm coming back, you start looking for these things. I want you to get ready. I want you to let me put my hands on your life in areas where you've never allowed before because I can handle it. I can take care of you. Verse 7, he goes on. He said, For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers or, or unknown places, not normal places, new places. He said, All these are the beginning of sorrows. What's going on? Jesus was telling us that when we see the things I've just mentioned, we need to start paying close attention. He said, because it's not the end of anything, rather it is the beginning of some sorrows. Not necessarily judgments, although people may look at it as judgment. But I want to tell you, if you've ever stood before a judge and got a, a negative uh, respect and response from him, his judgment brings sorrow. It, it makes you wish you had not done whatever you did because now you have to face the repercussions. God said these things are the beginning of sorrows. He said, these are the things that I'm going to allow to come. That I have set in before time that people, for the world, why? He said, because I am going to allow things to change in your world that will take you out of a place of peace, away from a place of comfort, away from a place of materialistic pursuit. And it's going to make you begin to look and say, is there a God? Where is that God? What is his name? Or, oh God, would you hold me? Would you keep me? You have been my anchor, you have been my rock, you have been my trust. I want you, he said, these are the beginning of sorrows. All I'm saying is this, and this troubled me all night long, that we as a church, and we as the world, all of us together, we cannot afford to live through the days ahead of us with no thought and consciousness of God and of eternity and saying, God, I need to make sure that I'm letting your hands work in my life in this hour because I don't have anywhere else to turn. Why would we not think that we should experience sorrow or if you want to use the term judgment, so be it. America, speak just to us. America's allowed same-sex marriage to be the law of the land. It's promoted and pushed. And it's contrary to the word of God. America has killed millions of innocent children in the womb. More children are dying in the womb by abortion that are dying from coronavirus. God could not be a just God to just turn his face away and never deal with our sins and our lives and our lifestyle. He would have to go back and restore Sodom and Gomorrah. But rather, he is long-suffering toward us. 
The scripture says not willing that any should perish. But he allows, he allows the effects of sin to multiply and for us to feel the weakness of our own humanity. We are the most, we are the most uh, intelligent nation in the world. We are the most prosperous nation in the world. We have the best doctors in the world. We feel so secure within our own existence. And yet we have a virus that has invaded us. And all of a sudden the doctors are saying, we can't fix it. The bankers can't fix it. The government can't fix it. The jobs can't fix it. What's going on? God said, it's the beginning of sorrows. And I need you to turn your face towards me. Because I know how to heal. And I know how to save. And I know how to protect. Because my purpose is not in this world. But it is in the world to come. Romans 11, 22 says it like this. It says, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity. But the, toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou shalt be cut off. God is telling us that I am a God. That when you walk with me in relationship and as you get to know me, you're going to see two different sides. I'm a God of goodness. I'm a God of love. I'm a God of mercy. I'm a God of grace. I'm a God of healing. I'm a God of restoration. I'm a God that died on the cross for all of humanity for their sin. But if they choose to continue to walk in sin, if they choose to reject my word, he said, did you see the severity of my word for I cannot lie? The Bible tells us that no sin shall enter there. And that with sin in our lives, we will die spiritually and only will spend an eternity in eternal damnation. I'm hurrying towards a close. God's word tells us Titus 3 and 5, that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the hope of a haircut applied in analogy to the scripture. We can keep getting the same results we've been getting. Some of you that are listening to me tonight I, I know by what I feel more than what I might know in my mind, but some of you listening to me tonight, your hearts are backslidden. You're away from God. You weep at night. You so want the mercy of God, but you're not willing to sit down in his chair of grace and let him work. I'm challenging you in this hour to realize that God has created or allowed a storm of life and circumstance to bring your life down narrow where it's, it's you and God. I'm hearing it from churches and pastors and believers all over. The phrase keeps coming back. All we can do is pray. But I want to tell you that prayer and trusting the God of all grace and his spirit and his power and his word is the most powerful thing that any man or woman can ever, ever, ever do. Saint of God, worrying, trying to figure out tomorrow, stop that and go to prayer and lean on God. Backslidden heart, trying to figure out, am I going to be lost? Am I going to survive? Will God love me? Will God take me back? You'll never know until you ask. Go to him, pray, give him that opportunity. If you've never known God, then I want you to know you're not going to be saved by what you do, but you're going to be saved by the grace and mercy of God. Romans 10 and 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let me just touch this. Believing in and of itself is not salvation. The Bible says, He that cometh unto God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of him that diligently seek him, or them that diligently seek him. He said the beginning point is believing. He said that the ultimate work, he said, is knowing that I'm a rewarder if you diligently seek him. It is one thing to say I believe in God. It's another thing to believe in the word of God enough to obey it. 
I believed my wife for 35 years that she could cut my hair, that she could do it well, but I never allowed her to put her hands on my head and to work in that manner. I'm challenging you tonight to get alone with the Word of God, to get alone in a prayer room and say, okay, God, I believed in you for years. I believe there's a higher power. I believe there's a God that exists. But God, I have never diligently pursued you. But in this crisis period of time, in my isolation, I'm not going to miss my moment. God, will you reveal yourself to me? Will you let your word speak to me? God, will you touch me? God, will you let your spirit come? And I promise you, God will do exactly that. Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Saving power is in the name of Jesus. Psalmist said in 37, 39, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. If you want salvation and you want strength, you're going to have to find that in God. And I want to tell you tonight, I'm not here trying to catch you as a captive audience or buttonhole you or push you into a corner. The Bible tells us that no man cometh unto God save the Spirit draw him. But I believe by what I feel in my heart and spirit right now that God is drawing somebody. He's drawing several somebodies. He's drawing precious believers back into a place of renewal and fresh repentance before him in humility. He's calling people that are on the fringe and in the distance saying, hey, come back home. Come back to me. Let me love you. Let me work in your life again. Let me give you everything that I designed for you. And he's calling to others who have never called on the name of the Lord. He's saying, call on me. Come to me. I want to be your help. I want to be your savior. I want my spirit to fill you and I want you to fulfill my purpose upon the earth. This is the God that we serve. Again, it's the hope of a haircut when crisis puts you in a place and you say, okay, I've heard your voice for years. Now I'm in a place. Can I turn in heaven? Forgive me, God. I got nowhere else to go. Nobody else I can call. All of my other helps in life are shut down and closed down. And God, I've still got needs. Lord, I've got fears. I've got addictions. We've got violence in our home. God, I've got things I'm wrestling with. Lord God of heaven, i got bills to pay. I don't know how to pay it. I've got an eternity that I'm facing and I'm not sure I'm ready. So God, right here, right now, in this moment, I open my heart and I pray, God, forgive me. God, wash me. Lord God, forgive me for anything wrong that I've ever done, known or unknown. And God, I pray, put your hands on my life. Put your hands, God, on the proverbial head of my spirit, oh God, and begin to pray over me and minister to me, oh Lord, as I open my heart and my mind and my soul. Because God, I need you now more than ever before. God, I'm sorry maybe that I made you a last resort, but God, you are my only hope. And so here I come, God. Would you help me? We prepare to close. Scripture says this. This is the end of it all. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, reading down. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, that's us here tonight, shall be caught up 
together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now listen to verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The hope of a haircut, the hope of heaven's hands in your life. You let God do his thing in your world. Not just hear his word, but obey his word. And your future is well taken care of. And tonight I come to give you words of comfort. This present thing, it shall pass. Heaven and earth may pass away. But the word of our God, Isaiah 48, shall stand forever. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Jesus loves you. Bring your life to him. Sit down in his chair and let him go to work on your life. If you got sin, repent. If you got sickness, ask him for healing. If you've got anxiety, ask him for peace because Jesus Christ is the answer not only for the world but for your world today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, I pray tonight, lay your hand down upon every heart that is listening. I pray tonight, God, that you would draw, God, every heart nearer unto you. Lord, in this time of uncertainty in this world, let our eyes and hearts be turned towards the world which is to come. Lord God, I pray, fill people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, reveal yourself to them, the glory and power of your name. Lord, lead people unto baptism. Lord God, I pray, let them reach out to me, to this church, God. We will help them. God, I pray this Sunday, send people here. Draw them here. Let them come. We will baptize them in the name of Jesus. Let their sins be washed away. God, believing that you will fulfill your word and fill them with the Holy Ghost. God, comfort our hearts with your words that, Lord, there is a better time coming. There's something beyond the present, and it is secure in your hands. We pray in the name of Jesus, and everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. Good night, and we'll see you on Sunday.